and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we go back to February 1985 to get all the latest Sinclair news and top selling Spectrum games, we check out the Spectrum demo scene, we review some older games, check out a newer title, and drop into Type In Corner. But first, it's back into the time machine in February 1985. With the world looking at the famine in Ethiopia, the British software industry has decided to do something to help. Rod Cousins, managing director of Quicksilver, has brought together a mass of software houses to release a compilation of games with proceeds going to aid the famine victims. Called Soft Aid, the collection will be released for both the Spectrum and Commodore 64 with the Spectrum version featuring games like Fred, Horace Go Skiing, Ant Attack and 3D Tanktual. Sinclair announced last month that they were to discontinue producing the Rubikeeds version of the Spectrum, instead concentrating on the new Plus model. Because of this, many high street stores have drastically reduced the prices for current stocks of the 48K machine. Curry's, Dixon's and WH Smith are all selling the machine for just £99. Sinclair has finally cut the price of its microdrive cartridges, something that the industry and users have been asking for. The reduction is better than most people thought, with Sinclair hoping it will boost sales of both the interface and microdrive peripherals. The retail price comes down from $4.95 to just $1.99, with good discounts for bulk buyers such as distributors. Prism, the once main distributor for Sinclair products and provider of the popular VTX5000 modem, have gone into receivership. Sinclair has gradually reduced its reliance on Prism, giving them just 30% of the distribution work. There is speculation that Sinclair recognised issues within Prism, which is why they slowly moved away from having them as their main distributor. Prism were also the company involved in the Spectrum theft, as widely reported in July 1983 in both the media and episode 5 of this show. Acon has drastically slashed its price of its Acon Electron, bringing it into direct competition with Sinclair's Spectrum Plus machine. The machine has been reduced from £199 to just £129. Rumours of bad Christmas sales and a share price fall to just 43p prompted some speculation of the health of the company, but Chris Curry, managing director, denies anything is wrong. Results of an independent survey, though, show Acon machines being outsold by their main rivals by some considerable numbers. Acorn selling 215,000 to Sinclair's 765,000 and Commodore's 425,000. And now on to the top selling games. New in the charts this month come Gift from the Gods, a graphical adventure game from Ocean Software. Taking its lead from the cinema we have Ghostbusters from Activision. follow-up to their hit game Trashman, New Generation bring us Travel with Trashman. And finally, the game of the TV series, Blockbusters, released by Mexen Software. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from February 1985. As a massive fan of Amiga demos, I hoarded hundreds of them, but sadly they all went when I sold my machine. Luckily though, I can still watch them via emulation or on YouTube. I enjoyed them sometimes more than the games. It wasn't just the music and graphics that I liked, but the fact that these coders, often in faraway countries, could squeeze so much out of the machine in real time, often producing much better results than the top game makers. I knew other machines had thriving demo communities, but what surprised me was the demo scene for the Spectrum. I knew obviously it couldn't match the Amiga, but it was a real eye-opener what I found. A demo usually refers to a presentation of graphics and sound that are calculated and displayed in real time. The machine is doing all the work, and this puts everyone on a level playing field, so the emphasis was on technical ability. On 
loading a few Spectrum demos up, it soon became apparent that the scene was very much alive, with new demos coming out all of the time, some pushing the humble Spectrum to its limits. Some demos were even written to run on specific models, and some only worked on real machines. Amiga demos usually consisted of a few basic concepts, and those have made the transition to the Spectrum scene. Copper bars, so called because they are generated by the copper on the Amiga. The Spectrum doesn't have a copper or a blitter chip, but we still find them in demos. Then there's vectors. Initially they were only wireframe, moving to hidden line removal and finally fully filled. The Spectrum has these too, a great feat of coding considering the speed of the CPU, which is having to do all of the calculations. Next, blobs or vector blobs. These are impossible on the Spectrum due to hardware restrictions and yet, here they are, we find many instances of them in demos. The staple of most demos is scroll text, one or more lines of text scrolling across the screen. Relatively easy to do, so no surprise to see them on the Spectrum. Sometimes we get variations too, with text moving in different directions, or being warped around the screen. Then there's bitmap manipulation. A full screen or large image spun around and zoomed in and out or morphed into another object. Very tricky on the spectrum because it just hasn't got the hardware to move all that graphic data around. We do get some impressive image effects though. Then there's plasma. This is a graphic effect that takes thousands of colours and washes them around the screen in a liquid-like effect, changing shape and colour as it goes. Obviously this is difficult for the Spectrum having only 8 colours, but the code has still managed to do it. Then there's parallax effects where there are several layers of images moving at different speeds to give the impression of depth. One thing that's common to every demo, or at least 99.9% .9 of them, is music. The Amiga had its own dedicated 4-channel stereo digital sound chip, producing some truly memorable tunes. The Spectrum, of course, in its early days just had a beeper, but the 1 to 8K machines had the AY chip that gave us some nice music. Sadly though, most demos opt for a sort of acid house thumping tune, which sometimes suits the demo, and other times not. Then there's the greets, or greeting screen. This is where the group that wrote the demo sends greetings to other groups. The greet screens can be anything from scroll text images or fancy effects. Something missing in a lot of demos is a story. There are a few ones that incorporated them, but the ones on the Amiga, things like Desert Dream or Odyssey for example, were all good. On the Spectrum I couldn't find any with a story, but a few of them had some really nice concepts. Proper animation, as in like cartoon style animation rather than morphing or vector bobs, was not very common in the Amiga unless you looked at specialist demos. And on the Spectrum, they're few and far between, but you can find them. Thank you.
course every demo likes to have its graphics and there are some really great examples on the Spectrum. And of course, with all the coders trying to outdo and do something different, there's always weird stuff that doesn't have a proper name, but still looks spectacular. You take all of these elements and throw them together, along with some clever colour manipulation, nice scrolls and transitions, and you get the feeling for what a demo is. Each one is different from the next, and it's great to spend a few hours trawling through the masses of files, watching, listening and comparing, as well as enjoying them of course. You can pick up demos from various places, check out some of the addresses on screen. And there are some really great demos out there, many of the new ones seemingly to ignore the colour limitations of the machine itself. Some of them used interlacing to simulate more colours, although these flickered badly on emulators and the real machine, and proved impossible to capture in the normal manner. Instead, I had to use a camcorder. There are more demos than I could possibly have time to watch, and that doesn't even include the demos for the Russian machines like the Pentagon or Scorpion. And if you don't fancy downloading them into an emulator, you can always watch them on YouTube. However you watch them, or indeed if you watch them at all, I would certainly recommend viewing at least a few of them, even if it's just the ones mentioned in this feature, to get a feel for what the Humble Spectrum can really do, when put into the hands of talented coders. Initially, you'd be forgiven for thinking that Kong Strikes Back is the follow-up to Kong, but it isn't. Released in 1984 by Ocean Software, the game is actually a clone of another arcade game, Mr. Doom's Wild Ride. The cassette inlay claims you have to rescue the damsel who has been held captive by the mighty Kong at the top of a fairground ride. You have to dodge the roller coaster cars, as well as pipes and springs, presumably thrown by the gorilla himself. Unlike the original Kong game, there are no ladders to the level above. Instead, the ladders allow you to climb above the track and let the cars pass beneath you. Some ladders also have bonuses above them. The track is a one-way route as well, and the whole game is a test of timing and coordination. You have to constantly keep an eye on the cars, even if they aren't on the particular track that you are, as they can still kill you from above if they come into contact with you. You are armed with bombs, and when thrown, will blow up the cars. This can be used instead of climbing the ladders, and on some levels has to be used. You also have a limited number, so use them sparingly. The gameplay is nice, allowing you to progress easily, and there aren't too many sudden deaths. The graphics are nice and well defined too, and move smoothly enough. Sound wise it's pretty sparse, just the sound for walking and throwing bombs, and of course dying, but they're all the basic same sound effect. Control is crisp and there isn't any lag, making the whole experience great. You have a wide choice of controls too, including Kempston, Sinclair, Fuller and Cursor joysticks, as well of course as redefinable keys. The tracks change each level, and after a set number, Kong himself appears. There isn't any change to gameplay on these end of level screens though. On completing it just takes you to the next set of levels, with the same track layouts with different obstacles. Sometimes the game pace can be a bit slow, especially if you are waiting for the cars to pass underneath you, but despite this the game is still addictive enough to want to go back and have another go. A good game then, and a nice change from the usual shooting, which we'll get onto later.
Occasionally, companies that specialise in action games release something outside of their comfort zone, and although Quicksilver did put out the odd adventure game now and again, its main staple of releases were aimed at arcade fans. Dragon's Bane then, released in 1983, had a really nice cover, as did most of the other Quicksilver games, and pointed to a game that didn't feature alien blasting. Once loaded, the game generates a random maze before throwing you in at the deep end, with just a sword and some food. The idea that a game is simple. Wander around the corridors and rooms of Earthstone Castle and try to rescue the princess. The simple view is drawn in wireframe 3D, with various monsters shown as large graphics. At the top of the screen is an input area where you control the game via single key commands, and a list of all these commands can be viewed by pressing H. On the right hand side you can see your selected weapon, room number, and various statistics such as strength, endurance and skill. Other markers show how close you are to the princess and the dragon, and these will instantly tell you if you're moving in the right direction or not. You move around using the cursor keys, or a joystick, which can be initially very confusing, but to sum up, 5 moves you left, 8 moves you right, 7 moves you up, and 6 moves you down. To understand that, imagine you're looking at a map, so key 7 will take you to the room to the north. Confused? Well, so was I. After a few hours of play, it finally dawned on me how the game engine worked. The room drawing is accurate, so use this. Moving around is straightforward, but you have to remember that if you move left or right, your view is rotated in that direction, and you are moved into the adjacent room. So for example, if there is a doorway to the right, and you're facing north, pressing 8 will move you into that room, and also rotate your view so that you are now facing east. Once you grasp this concept, moving around becomes a whole lot easier. As you move around, you use up your strength, and to replenish it, you need to eat food, which is in short supply. As you move around, the screen updates, and it won't be long before you meet up with a creature of some kind. Some creatures are friendly too, and you can trade items for food. Most though will just attack you without any warning, so you have to think fast, and make sure you've got enough food at all times. The monster fights are depicted in words, with your statistics and selected weapon calculated against the creatures. The outcome can also have random elements. Most of my early attempts seemed to end up with me running away, or getting killed, which was very frustrating. If you are getting battered, you are given the chance to flee, which takes you to another room. However, the creatures can follow you, and continue to kick seven bells out of you. If this continues, you have no chance to eat food, and will very quickly end up dead. The other problem is, the creature placement is random, so rather than introducing you to progressively tougher creatures, you could get thrown in straight at the deep end with a dark knight, and have no chance at all. I found that the best tactic was to stock up with food whenever possible, although you have to be careful, eating too much gives you indigestion. Yes, I kid you not, and this will reduce your strength even more. After about 30 minutes of moving around, fighting monsters and chatting to sphinxes, my food ran out, and that was the end of the game, more or less. Once my strength had reached zero, I died. It would seem you have a limited amount of time to complete the task, based on the amount of food you have, which in turn is dependent on how many monsters you fight. There are food parcels lying around, if you're lucky, and you can also trade items that you find with some creatures. But these opportunities are rare. So, the aim of the game is to use the proximity guides to head in the right direction as quickly as possible, while eating when required, and try not to get your head smashed in by the various creatures. I've played this game for ages, and probably spent a good four hours trying to get close to the princess. And when I finally found her, in room one, I was told that I couldn't actually free her until I'd found two keys. Great! So off I went again, randomly moving about, trying to find the keys. One key was randomly placed in the castle. The other one, so I found out, was guarded by the Dragon Lord in room 172. Once you've got both keys, head back to room 1, and the game is completed. I had to use the infinite food poke, and this does improve the gameplay a lot and makes it much more enjoyable. You still have to remember to eat to keep your strength up, but you just don't have to worry about running out. I don't think this game is to everyone's taste, and it's a great pity that the navigation is so painful to use. Once you understand how it works though, it does improve the overall gameplay. Not a bad game once you get into it, but not for everyone.
Starfirebirds was released in 1985 by Insight Software and swiftly re-released by Firebird Software. The game is based on the arcade shooter Space Firebird that you can see on screen now. The Spectrum had a lot of old school shooters in the early days and these attempts were usually very poor character based games with little or no quality. Some games stood out but for us old fashioned arcade lovers the pickings were very thin with games like Phoenix from Megadodo and Mooncrestor from Incentive standing out. Here then is another one worth mentioning, a game you can just pick up and play. It follows the usual style of vertical shooters, no scrolling landscapes to get in the way, just a nice star field and lots of aliens to shoot. Things seem to move slowly at first, even your laser shots appear pedestrian, but you soon realise that they match the pace of the game really well. Flocks of aliens swoop around firing at you and your job is to survive and rack up a huge score. Different types of aliens appear later on, like a large bomb that slowly heads down the screen, and of course large firebirds. I don't think there's any special tactics, just keep moving and blasting. The one annoying thing was that, occasionally, aliens would appear from underneath you, giving you no warning, and destroyed your ship instantly. After spending hours learning and playing Dragon's Bane, this was a real breath of fresh air. Something to take out my frustration on. Controls can be by keyboard, Kempston, Interface 2 or Cursor Joystick, and there are different levels of play, from easy to dangerous. On the easy level, things are manageable and you usually get a nice long game. The control is very responsive too, but the sound is a little lacking, with just firing and explosions. The Spectrum could never match the arcade machine, but a little more would have been nice. On the easy level, the game starts slower than the arcade, and as you move up the levels, the speed increases. I would say that probably level 3, just about matches the arcade for speed. It's a great little shooter this, only let down by the aliens that suddenly appear at the bottom of the screen and kill you. Impossible to dodge because you can't see them coming, but very annoying when you lose a life through no fault of your own. So if you like shooters, grab yourself a copy of this and have some real fun. Cray 5 was released by Retroworks in 2011, and the story goes something like this. Because of pollution, governments of the Earth have got together and come up with a plan for space colonisation. A huge spaceship is built, with 500 crew, and it's launched off into space to find a new home. However, things don't go to plan, and the computer controlling everything, the Cray 5, is damaged in an asteroid collision. Because of the damage, the computer enters self-destruct mode, and the countdown begins. Obviously, this is not so good and it's up to you to repair it. To do this you have to disconnect the main computer by activating all of the switches. These switches are placed around the ship and require keys to enter the areas. You're armed with a pulse rifle, which can be used to destroy the guard droids, but you also have to avoid some parts of the wall, as these can drain your spacesuit. Flying around is easy, however avoiding collisions isn't, and careful manoeuvring is the key to this game. You can only carry one key at a time too, so you have to plan your route. The graphics are great and very colourful and detailed as you can see, and they move very smoothly. The control is sharp and responsive, and it's a real joy to play this game. Sound is also great with a good tune at the start, and music that continues to play throughout the game. Sound effects are also used to good effect. Difficulty is about medium I'd say, and once you learn how to control your man, it becomes a matter of avoiding the magnets, hazardous walls and droids, and remembering where the keys and switches are. The game map is huge, so this is not a quick game to finish. This is a great game that will keep you playing for ages, and is highly recommended.
welcome to this week's typing. This week the game is Meteor Belt, written by Michael Kay and published in November 1983 edition of Popular Computing Weekly. The game wasn't deemed good enough to be the star game and the listing was tucked away in the back pages. Being all in basic it was quite fast to enter, with a very low chance of having any errors. The idea of the game is that you have to guide your little man through an asteroid belt, avoiding the yellow meteors and at the same time eating green apples. I've no idea why there should be green apples in space, or indeed why there's a man in space wandering about. If you don't eat the apples, your energy will run out and the game will end. I changed one line of code to stop the game printing a number on screen during the scroll. If you want to put it back in the original state, just replace line 150 with line 151. If you manage to survive long enough and get past the last few meteors that speed up towards the end, you get onto the next level. Controlling the game is simple, just use keys 0 and 1 to move left and right, but because of the number of meteors it can be quite tricky. This is a typical short game for 1983, written in BASIC with all the usual problems that BASIC has, but it was easy to type out and is quite fun to play. This game has not been seen since it was published and can be downloaded from my blog along with all the others featured in Typing Corner. That's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help make in the next one, get in touch via the details below. See you soon.